The Batman feels almost like no other in the Dark Knight cinematic history. Don't get me wrong, it definitely has similarities and we feel the influence of certain films before it. There's remnants of Christopher Nolan's trilogy and just how gritty and unapologetic the Batman can feel at times. This is clearly a film made for mature audiences coming through its other influences there too. From the crime-centric dramas of the 1970s to the complete other side and further forward inspirations of the superhero craze that's taken over film in the past decade and a half or so. The Batman wears its inspiration on its sleeves as we get to witness this deeper world that feels like it has many moving parts. Gotham here feels like it has characters who can appear from time to time and not play as the big bads just yet, as we see with Colin Farrell's The Penguin here, who is undeniably unrecognizable. I really appreciated his appearance as somebody who played as a small key part in the plot but didn't necessarily drive it. That's a really cool thing that I don't think we often see in a lot of superhero content. A lot of the time I think that there's a fear of waste, like as if showing The Penguin now and not having him be the main antagonist would somehow mean that we missed that shot. But the Batman shows restraint though and proves that this is a better way to set something like this up. When the Penguin returns in a further film, which I assume is coming our way, it'll work as a better payoff than if he's just shown up randomly. In this way, you can feel the Batman's sprawling potential for future additions to this series, and it makes it feel like a real lived-in world where characters can come in and out of it. I won't go as far into saying that Gotham feels like a super distinct setting here though, in a way that's as strong as something you'd see in the comics or Arkham games, but it does feel closer to where it should be, somewhere in between the bombastic, crazy, gothic aesthetic of Tim Burton's Batman films and a very serious and almost nondescript one that we see in the Nolan trilogy. And the city is at its very best depicted here during the very opening of the film, where we get a broody, emo-like voiceover monologue by Pattinson's Batman introducing us to a regular old Thursday in Gotham. It's Halloween night where the freaks start to fly and Batman is on the prowl. With this very heavy attitude, we get the idea of this melancholic and dour world and the Batmans, well, Batman comes to life in front of our eyes. It's here where I have to say that I really appreciated that this movie skipped the freaking old origin story. I'm so glad because we don't need it. Not even somebody who's never heard of Batman necessarily needs to hear the origins during their first experience with his material. So it always annoys me when films feel like they need to hold your hand and explain things every step of the way. We get it. He's a bat. Man! And if you don't get that, you'll catch up. The Batman understands this and actually respects its audiences here. But anyway, getting back to where the film actually does start off as Batman describes the function of what he does for the city by night. Here we get a full insight into just how big a threat he poses from the eyes of those who should be afraid. The everyday common thugs of this urban metropolis. No Batman film has articulated the fear that the man ignites in the eyes of petty criminals of the streets of Gotham quite like this opening. And I like the idea that Batman does doesn't even need to be there to impact that paranoia. Seeing it from their point of view for a few brief moments wasn't vital, but it did a lot for me in terms of really showing Batman's reputation. It becomes so that every shadow poses a threat, and it just might be you who the Dark Knight's after tonight. Because when that signal goes up, as Batman himself says, it's not just a call to him, but a warning to them. It's so goddamn perfect, and as he describes fear being used as a tool, I just love it so much. But as superhero movies typically go, for is not as a typical superhero movie as this is, even so. The rule still stands that a movie like this usually can only be as good as the protagonist's adversary. And the Batman has one hell of an adversary to this version of the Caped Crusader. The Riddler here is the main villain and is what every good Batman villain is, more symbol than person. Paul Dano's Riddler works best as inspiration to those who back him and his power only comes from reason, and much less so strength, charisma or personality. Instead, in the end, it's proven that it doesn't even matter who the Riddler truly is, as per his legal identification anyway. The truth is that he is no one at all, no one special, no one that anyone will recognize without the mask. As he explains who he is when he wears the mask is his true identity. The skin of his face isn't who he's comfortable appearing as. When presented like that, he's just some loser like everybody else. From his point of view, without the mask, he's just an orphan and with very little power. But when wearing his intimidating costume, that's when he can flourish, much like, as he points out, Batman can too. The Riddler realizes for both he and Batman that it doesn't matter who's underneath the mask. That's irrelevant. They are who they are when they are in those costumes because Batman, the actual man himself, is the Batman and Bruce Wayne is just the name that he was given. While in the Batman persona, Bruce has some control he can conduct himself. Though running purely on vengeance and rage, I think he can find some form of peace knowing he's fighting the good fight. But I think that when he's alone in his home as Bruce Wayne and not providing his own brand of justice that he only feels 
guilt and sadness. Bruce Wayne as a man is still that angry, torn up inside husk of a man, with a tormented soul and a lot of resources. He's found that he's only fulfilled when wearing the cowl. And this is where the Riddler and Batman parallel perfectly. They're both just angry guys who went through similar trauma. Only one of them the world forgot about and left behind, and the other was left off with a level of wealth and status, fame and fortune that crowned him the name of the Prince of Gotham. Riddler looks at the sympathy Bruce Wayne garnered all that time ago and basically scoffed. Through it all, he had to endure it too, but without that luxury, without the privilege. All these years since, now during this film's span of a week through his villainous endeavours of putting corrupt citizens through basically sword traps, he causes an uprising of angry crowds just like him. It doesn't matter who the Riddler is, because the Riddler is all of them, one idea and movement, more than one villain. So when they all band together with a common cause in mind, they pose a threat as they're covered in easily replicated get-ups with rifles and a plan. All while by the end of the film, the Riddler becomes unmasked and captured, he still gets that moment of glory as the floods sweep through the city, and he knows that he still has those who will finish what he started. And it's not until here where Paul Dano is finally on screen for the first time as he gets arrested and thrown into Arkham Asylum. This is the one flaw that I actually had for the character here. I already knew that it was Paul Dano from public information, like he's been openly credited, he's been promoting the film in interviews and whatnot, and he's very much been a big part of the film opening. And that's honestly kind of annoying to me. It would have been cool to not know the identity of the Riddler and have that be a surprise going in, especially since he's a character shrouded in such mystery to begin with. But yeah, anyway, this Arkham Asylum scene is where we see him speak in person for the first time and not through a terrorist style live stream or recording. And what we come to realise is just how irritating he is. Paul Dano plays an annoying little shit not quite like any other, as he really got on my nerve as he started antagonistically singing, as Batman tries to gain intel from him nearing the climax of the film. This is where we get to see the Riddler poses some good points, and that he's clearly mentally unstable in some certain ways too, as he explains that the only way to cope through his grief-stricken childhood was to play games and riddles. The only way that the world began to make sense to him was through questions and definitive answers, because those he could control, or at least find out and resolve. In a world where he felt so powerless, stupid fucking riddles gave him some autonomy, and oh my god, did they just make the Riddler's reason for liking riddles actually deep and meaningful and really impressive writing? Yeah. That is what the Batman excels at. Presenting us with ideas we've seen before and silly premises like a man who clues the authorities in on his crimes with riddles and elevates it all to a mature and almost legendary status. Honestly, this version of the Riddler rivals Batman's best on-screen villains and I think that this film, The Batman, is going to age really, really well and be remembered fondly for a long time to come. Something else that I wanted to comment on was that I absolutely love seeing Batman help people out in the world from the flood at the end of the film. As he lifts people out from the rubble and shows them their way and helps with the cleanup and transportation of the injured. It just goes to show that you don't really need to do too much to be portrayed as heroic. This is when the character of the Batman did feel the most valiant and selfless to me. And I found that really interesting as per how very doable these actions in particular were. This moment wasn't a depiction of some out of this world super powered behemoth fighting off hordes of monsters and aliens, but just a real life feeling moment of a singular man just trying to do some good where he could in helping the common people. And I thought that that was honestly really moving and some of the best stuff that we've seen from Batman in film ever. I also thought that it was interesting though, as per timing, with how part of Australia at this very moment of recording has been flooding up in Queensland and part of New South Wales, and just how weirdly relevant this moment felt. It's honestly pretty hilariously bad timing though. I'm just imagining the good folk of the state of Queensland trying to go, you know, go about trying to escape their reality for a moment by going to see some silly Batman movie, but then getting like more flood images thrown back into their faces again and just being reminded of all the stuff going on right now. Like, fuck, that's such bad timing. Ah, uh, but you know, obviously they didn't have that in mind or anything when making the film, but it is a little bit, oh God, it's just unfortunate. Another thing I briefly wanted to comment on was how Jeffrey Wright as a black man sold the character of Jim Gordon so damn well here. He freaking is Jim Gordon. And I'm sure there'll be some weirdos out there who are very unhappy with the fact that he is a different race from earlier iterations of the character. But to me, this was perfect proof that superficialities like that isn't the be all end all when it comes to characterization. His race wasn't 
wasn't really in any way relevant as he came off as somebody to look up and respect. He was Jim Gordon, a man of true morals and who will stand up for what is right when it comes to justice and his little pal Batman. I love the small moments of interaction too where we get to see that despite there being a little bit of tension between Batman, who is essentially a vigilante, and the police of Gotham, that Gordon is always there to back him. He believes in him and they have somewhat of a friendship that works really well here too. Sure, this is not an original idea for these characters by any means, but I think that the Batman sold it really well. And I think it's a funny idea to compare this version of Gordon to the recent cinematic version of Sully from Uncharted and showing just how terrible that one was and why race isn't the major contributing factor when it comes to the faithfulness of a character. Jeffrey Wright fucking is Gordon. Mark Wahlberg ain't no Sully. Something else I wanted to talk about, there's also a brief moment where Alfred uh, explodes, but then he's just like fine. <laughs> Like, he doesn't die, and I felt like that was a bit of a cop-out. But as it goes, as per the lore, typically Alfred is around as Batman gets older, and canonically this is meant to take place during Batman's second year. As well as on top of that, this being this version of Alfred's first outing, it would have admittedly felt pretty premature to just kill him off here. But honestly, I think it would have served the story better, and it did feel a bit silly having him literally explode and then just be fine. <laughs> but the moment where Bruce Wayne says, but doesn't actually vocalise specifically, that he came close to feeling that fear that engulfed him as a kid when his parents died when he thought that Alfred had. I won't lie, I almost got teary-eyed like as much as I believe that the Batman is a very personal take on Batman as a character. Despite that, he still doesn't show much emotion. Even here it was subdued, but you can feel that real bond between he and Alfred and just how impactful his death would have been. Which is exactly why it kind of annoys me that he didn't, but that's okay. Another little thing I wanted to explore regards to Catwoman. After watching the film, my wife said that she hated that she and and Batman kissed. It seemed as though that Selina was being sold as an independent character who's strong enough to, as a persona to go without Batman in a potential film or two. The movie really explored a lot about her in terms of setting her up as a full-fledged character of her own and yet when they kissed it just felt like she was being pushed off to the side as Batman's side piece instead. I didn't really want her to be somebody that could be described as Batman's girlfriend slash love interest or whatever and I'd have appreciated if they'd strictly been platonic. Maybe it could have eventually led to romance later on, but for what little romance there was anyway, them kissing felt really unnecessary to me. It just felt like an old movie cliche where the hero has to get the girl or whatever. And I know their sexual tension plays a strong part and is a presence throughout much of the source material, but it still, it seemed unneeded to me here. I'm curious as to whether anyone else feels this way as well. Let me know. And the last thing that I wanted to touch on was the goosebump inducing yet eye rollingly predictable decision to tease the iconic villain himself at the end of the film. Yes, the joke Joker is once again going to have another appearance in some upcoming film and I was just like oh my fucking god they just couldn't help themselves could they? The Joker is a very overplayed character in a world with so many great villains. Literally Batman is famous for having the best rogues gallery rivaled only by Spider-Man and I think it's a shame that we have to keep going back to the classics. That being said I'm still pretty fucking keen to see what they have in store anyway. <laughs> I know it's total nerd bait I know it's repetitive but god damn if that brief shot of a silhouette and the manic laughter that we got a glimpse of didn't send chills down my spine and it looked like a really faithful adaption based on what little we saw as he had that very strongly distinctive face shaped with razor sharp facial features. In the end, the Batman is honestly pure cinematic gold in my opinion. I struggled to think of any ways that it could have been much better. Well, this really is probably what I'd closely describe to as a near flawless film. If you only have three hours to live, please don't spend it watching this because it will just fly by and you'll be dead before you know it. I love how faithful it was to the source material. I loved Pattinson's performance as Bruce Wayne and Batman, and I loved just about every minute I had to experience of this thing. It's a fitting title too, because I think The Batman is going to ultimately act as a strong recourse for the future of DC films. Now that we're just about out of the goop of the Snyderverse and the frankly, in comparison to this film, embarrassment that was that iteration of DC films in terms of continuity and direction, I think The Batman is showing the huge potential for what's to come if they continue this way and I strongly hope that they do follow in the Batman's footsteps.